All right, guys, welcome back. In this video, I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about the slope deflection method and how we're going to use it to solve statically indeterminate beams. So if you look at this example here, this is a statically indeterminate beam that is statically indeterminate to the second degree, right? There is three reactions here at A, and then another reaction here and another reaction. So we have three equations of equilibrium and five unknowns, so that leaves us with two extra unknown forces. Makes it second degree statically indeterminate. This problem is also second degree kinematically indeterminate because there's two unknown slopes or deflections at the reactions. Um, we know that the slope and deflection at A, once the structure is loaded and deformed, the uh, slope and deflection are going to be zero. Deflection at B and C are going to be zero, but the slopes at B and C are, uh, are unknown. We don't know if they're going to be angled down or up or who knows what. So this is a second degree statically and kinematically indeterminate problem. Um, Typically, slope deflection method is good for solving problems that have lots of unknown forces and not many unknown slopes and deflections, um, but this is a second degree one and we can definitely do second degree problems uh, with slope deflection method. Okay, so the first thing that we do in the method is we actually remove the spans, we isolate the spans from the reactions, and then we draw on the internal moments, and we can also draw on the internal shears if we want, but we draw on the internal moment at each end, so we would call this the moment uh, basically of A when we're looking at B, so this is MAB, and then this here would be the moment B when we're looking at A. And then for the next span, we would draw this as the moment of B looking at C, and this is the moment at C uh, when we're looking over at B. And another thing that we can do if we want uh, is we can draw on the shear forces that we'll come back to later in the problems, so we could call this like uh, VA, um, this would be uh, VB1, let me draw this on as VB2, right, the shear is just on each end, just uh, just on each side of that support, and then uh, this here would be uh, VC. But the really important thing is that we draw on our moments, no matter which end we're drawing them on, we're always drawing on the moments in a clockwise sense. Notice here it's clockwise, here it's clockwise. The slope deflection method is basically based on the assumption that you're writing these things in, in a clockwise sense. So make sure you do these. Always define them as clockwise when you, when you follow this method. If you don't, you're just in for a world of hurt. We don't want that. So just draw these clockwise and you'll be okay. So if without actually knowing anything about these these um, the, the point load here or you know the, the distributed load, uh, at least we're able to name the internal moments um, at the ends and also the internal shears. And basically that you know it, what we can do is that really translates to some of the information about the reactions as well. Like a y here is just going to be equal to like the equal and opposite of v a right um, c y. So like we can even if a y was like that. Um, CY would just be equal to the equal and opposite, you know, of the shear force at C. Um, BY here, that's going to be equal to the sum of VB1 plus VB2. Because that's like if you cross, if you even look at a, a simple, um, if you ever look at a point load that's acting on a, a span of a beam, then the shear force basically jumps by the magnitude of the applied load. So this is really no different because this is only just applying a point load in the vertical direction. And then for the moments, um, well, MA would just be equal and opposite to MAB. So at least for the magnitude, we can say that's equal to MAB. Um, here at MAC, well, the moment at C actually here in this particular problem uh, would be equal to zero because we're at the end of a span with just a roller joint there. And then again, for this particular problem, um, if we looked at the middle here, um, that we could say that the moment of MBA plus MBC has to be equal to zero for static equilibrium at this point internally. Because if one of these is bigger than the other one, then at that point, the moments aren't balanced and this thing is gonna like rotate off into space or something. And uh, we're not getting that in these, in these problems where nothing's moving. So anyways, this stuff down here isn't really the important stuff yet. We'll come back to this later in the problems, but in these in these problems and you have a when you have a diagram like this, separate out the, each span. There might even be more. There might be two or like th or like three or four spans, however many there are. Separate out each span and draw on MAB, MBA, and etc. the end moments for each of them. That's the most important thing that you have to do. 
The next thing that we do is we uh, we redraw these spans that we've separated out, but we draw them with fixed rigid ends. So that if we applied these types of loadings across these spans, then we would actually get displacements that are like locked at each side. So their, their, their slopes are going to be zero. And in the case of these, um, the we call these the fixed end moments. Basically, this is the reaction moment uh, here. This would be F-E-M-A-B. F E M um, B A, and then this one again, following the same kind of naming convention. This is the fixed end moment of uh, C B, and then F E M C B. And in the back of any structural analysis textbook, you're going to find tables that describe what the fixed end moments are for loads, like a single point load at half span or a uh, distributed load, or any of the simple like standard types of loadings that you'll be getting tested on in this type of course. And so the fixed end moments are going to be negative PL over 8 and positive PL over 8 for the BA, and negative WL squared over 12 and positive WL squared over 12 for uh, BC. So when you draw these on, draw them again in the clockwise sense everywhere, and then when you do that, uh, this will likely match what you have in your table for fixed end moments. It's like an appendix probably in your book. Uh, and it'll give you this negative sign because really, if you pressed down on this, the, the actual uh, the moment that's resisting it here at the reaction would be going counterclockwise. Um, and, uh, and that's why you get the negative. Same thing here. If you're pressing down on the beam here, this one's correct. This one backwards. But just given with, the, with how the, uh, the slope deflection method works, we're drawing them on clockwise and then we're defining them as negative if they're going counterclockwise. So these values here for fixed end moments are really easy. You just plug in your force and your length and you divide it by whatever. If you have a different loading condition than this, just check and see what the actual fixed end moment formula is for that from the table. Um, but otherwise, what we're going to do is we're going to be using this in our slope deflection equation, which gives us the moment. So what, what this ij is like a and b, or basically whichever uh, whichever points on the beam that we're referencing. So if we're looking for M, A, B, we set I equal to A and J equals to B, and then we continue that on as we go through. So we would take two times the uh, flexural rigidity, E, I, uh, in, in this region, divided by the length of that span in meters, and then we would multiply it by the actual, this would be theta A plus theta J, so two times theta A um, plus theta B, and then minus this this term here, this variable psi here, this has to do with uh, problems where we're having settlement in a reaction. And uh, if you don't have settlement, uh, which a lot of problems don't, this will be zero and this whole term will go to zero. Um, and then we add in the FEMAB, which we have here is equal in this case to just the magnitude of that point load in this span um, times the length divided by eight. And uh, you're going to get an expression here that is going to be in this case, having two unknowns. It's going to be theta A and theta B. So for example, um, if we just wanted to write the uh, Mij, that basically the slope deflection equation for each of the possible uh, moments that we described earlier, we have these four equations where we get MAB, MBA, MBC, and MCB. So these are the actual internal moments that we have uh, as identified at the ends of each of the spans that we're working with. So these formulas typically simplify a lot um, when we do these. For example, if we did this exact problem, um, we look at theta A and theta B. So theta A on the actual deflected uh, structure is going to be zero because it's this rigid connection. And the moment at C, so MCB, the internal moment there is going to be zero as well. Uh, so if we come down to this, and, and we identify, we kind of acknowledge the things that are going on here. We say that uh, theta A is going to equal zero, and uh, MC is going to equal zero, and then also that point of uh, that point of continuity basically between here is that MBA plus MBC equal, has to equal zero as well. So we identify that uh, that we have MBA plus MBC has to be equal to zero. So when we when we apply those, and again, in this case, assuming that there's no settlement of any of the reactions, then uh, that's going to be zero as well. So if that's zero, then this whole thing goes to zero in all of the equations. Um, and in the case, if we were actually solving this example from this video, any of these theta a's go to zero. 
because we know that they're zero, so all those theta a's get canceled out. And then what we do is we also know that mcb is equal to zero. So we set that equal to zero. And then uh, we take mba plus mbc. So we just take this whole expression plus this whole expression, and we set that uh, equal to zero. And then what we have is what we'll end up with this expression equal to zero and the sum of these two expressions equal to zero. So that is really, uh, we have two equations with two unknowns. And so we'll end up getting something that resembles this. We'll have like a number, let's just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna write some random like made up constant numbers here because I don't really like having an equation with like a whole bunch of letters in it that represent constants. Um, so we'll, we'll get something that ends up looking like this. It'll be like a constant times theta b plus uh, some other constant times theta c is equal to some other constant. Let's just say it's 30 or whatever. Again, just making up some, some numbers here. Uh, then we're all gonna get another equation uh, that this will simplify to that will be like another constant. It'll have the same form. So it'll be another constant times uh, theta b plus another constant times theta c uh, equal to some other constant. So we have, we'll get something that looks like this where our unknowns are theta b and theta c whole bunch of other constants. So what we can do is we have, uh, we can solve this simultaneously by, uh, by substitution if we want, or the other way that you can solve it if you're, if you're into it is you can uh, basically write this as an augmented matrix. So in this case, if this was actually what we had, um, we can write this as like uh, 10, 20, uh, 40, 50, and then throw on these guys on the other side. So 30, 60, and uh, if you actually went and solved, let's say these were the actual numbers, you actually go and solve this augmented matrix, you get it to reduced row echelon form. Yeah, if you didn't like linear algebra, it's gonna come back and <laughs> haunt you forever, but basically you would get something that looks like this. Again, these are made up numbers, but you'll have some other numbers that you can do this with. Um, and if these were your numbers, then, then this would tell you basically that uh, like theta b is equal to, in this case, it would be negative one, and then theta c in this case would be equal to two. And then what you do is you take these, because these were your unknowns, now you know them. You could have got them by substituting in here, you get exactly the same number. Um, and then what you do is you plug them back into these four equations. So one, two, three, four. Because the you have, you have theta b's in here, you have theta c's in here, so you plug those back in, and that's going to give you an answer basically in kilonewton meters um, that is going to give you uh, the moments. So MAB, MBA, MBC, and MCB. So that's really cool. Um, so now you actually get those values. And then if you revisit the free body diagrams, where are they, uh, that we drew here um, for each span, um, basically this here will be known. This will be a known number. This will be a known number. And this will be a known number. And then basically all you're left with is the unknowns being your shear. And you can find the shear, you basically take like some of the moments, um, some of the moments about point A, and you can find what VB1 is for this system, and then do the sum of forces in the y direction, and you'll get VA. And then do the same thing in this system, take the sum of moments about any point, it's typically easy to start on the left hand side. You'll solve for VC, and then uh, you can do the sum of forces in the y direction, and uh, you'll solve for VB2. And then you basically have everything that you need in this problem. You have the shear at each end. You have the moments at each end. You know, uh, you know how to basically draw a shear force diagram with that information. Um, and then even that information is going to tell us things like the reaction here. It's going to be the equal and opposite magnitude of the shear force and the moments. Uh, and then we can knowing some information here about like distributed loads and what to do when we have point loads. Uh, yeah, we can totally draw the shear force diagram and bending moment diagram. So. Hopefully that all makes sense. If not, that's okay. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot to kind of take in the first time you see it. Um, but hopefully you watch this video, think about it for a little while, and then, uh, and then join me in the next video. We're going to go through an example that is actually going to be a little bit easier than this one in the next video. We're just going to do one that's one degree of uh, indeterminacy or kinematic indeterminacy. Uh, and then probably the video after that, uh, we'll go ahead and put some numbers on this exact problem and we'll solve that. So guys, thanks a lot for watching and I will see you in the next video.